This is Heart Edition. Good evening and welcome. My name is Beatrice Adu. The news is also live on Kesme 107.1 and across the world at 3news.com. Coming up in the next 60 minutes. Government rolls out program to license additional satellite internet service providers to deal with disruptions to internet connectivity in the country. We are live in Parliament where Minister of Communications and Digitalization Eslo Kufol is briefing legislators about the situation. Also in this program, impending legal drama following the demolition of one of Accra's biggest event centers, the Fantasy Dome, as owner accuses the trade fair company of being behind the pulling down of a structure he invested $5 million to build. Tonight, we bring you the legal and financial ramifications in a demolition that seems to have breached a court injunction. Later on this program, opposition NDC demands immediate dismissal of Minister of Youth and Sport over all African Games organizational challenges. Thank you very much for joining us. And now the Minister for Communications, Eslo Usu Kufol, has indicated to Parliament that the government is rolling out a program to license additional satellite internet service providers to deal with the disruption to internet services in the country. She says that global satellite internet service provider Starlink is in the process of being licensed to operate in Ghana. Briefing Parliament on the issue of internet disruptions, Madam Kufol said that it would take a a minimum of five weeks for the damaged undersea cables causing the outage to be fixed. Any defects and which will be fixed and then lowered back to the seabed. This process, I'm told, might take between one and two weeks for the rep actual repairs, while it will take about two to three weeks of transit time for the vessel to pick up the spares and then travel from Europe to West Africa once the vessel is mobilized. And that is why the NCA indicated that it would take a minimum time of a period of about five weeks for full services to be restored. With regard to the use of satellites as an alternative, it is important to note that the bandwidth of a satellite backup for network operators cannot replace the capacity that has been lost due to the outage. Satellite backup for consumers is more feasible. However, the cost is relatively much higher than the terrestrial solutions. Immediate initiatives that need the government will undertake is that we will license satellite gateway earth stations, London rights, and satellite earth station networks. One web has already been licensed. Starlink is in the process of being licensed. And other operators are being encouraged to land in Ghana. We must also invest in operationalizing RASCOM, the regional African satellite company, instead of each company, each country going it alone. All network operators must arrange and implement alternative routes to restore full services as they are currently doing. Organizations and enterprises are also encouraged to host their content and services in at least two tier three or four data centers in country in different locations and public organizations must utilize the national data center as either their primary or backup recovery disaster recovery data host the nca did not have a framework for licensing satellites but the authority has in the last year concluded benchmarking and learning from other jurisdictions where this has been implemented currently They've developed a satellite licensing framework in Ghana, which has been approved by its board and are awaiting the final policy approval. This framework will provide the policies and rules relating to the application for frequency authorizations for satellite services in Ghana. It outlines the various categories of satellite services, the licensing requirements, and its associated fees. 
a draft framework was subjected to industry consultation and approved by industry. The you heard that uh, Eslo Usuekufu, she's the Minister for Communications and Digitalization. Duke Opoku Mensa is a man in Parliament. He joins us live now. Duke, what more can you tell us about what the Minister submitted before the MPs today? Well, so as we speak, members of Parliament are commenting on the statement that she made and also fielding um, certain questions that may need to be clarified by her. So um, again, she did indicate that from the, ongoing, uh, from the ongoing investigations that have been conducted, it doesn't look like that this was caused by human interruption or by anchoring or by fishing activities. And that the most likely cause of this uh, is um, a landslide um, within the ocean or on the seabed. She also did indicate that one of the reasons why Etoc Tigos uh, or AT customers still had um, uh, internet services during the disruption is because they had also connected to another submarine cable provider in Nigeria, apart from the uh, marine provider, uh, submarine cable provider in Ghana, which docks in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, which has been disrupted. So this is what she's been explaining, and also giving details as the measures government has taken, indicating that they must license more satellite to air operators of internet, even though that will cost a lot more, and then also asking the internet service asking the internet service providers and the mobile telephone network operators to also uh, have alternative or standby arrangements with other cable providers outside Ghana in a bid to have um, such, to forestall any such occurrences to prevent uh, a total blackout when there's uh, an issue like this. Uh, she also did indicate that they had already, um, NCA had already communicated to these MNOs, the mobile network operators, to diversify the cables that they use so that all of them will not be on one cable or on a number of cables uh, in case where there will be a total, there would have been a total blackout, which is based on which Etel decided, Etel to go and others decided to diversify their portfolio. And that's how come when um, the internet disruption was at its height, uh, there were still minimal services on some of the networks, and then Etel to go still had um, its network up and running. So these are some of the answers she's been providing on the floor. Mm, Duke, as so we speak, mm, yeah. as we speak, please go ahead. Yeah, as we speak, um, members are communicating or members are, big, um, are contributing to the statement and also asking relevant questions. After which she will come back to respond to the concern. Duke, you mentioned wrapping up this encounter. Mm, you mentioned that the minister uh, and we actually heard her as well in that voice that Starlight is being contracted to come on board. Yet she maintained the five weeks uh, ultimatum, as it were, or timeline that the National Communications Authority gave us earlier. And we also know that during the day we've had communication from uh, Telecel, MTN, and I believe other oh. mobile network services talking about adding on additional capacity. Can you tell us why we're having all of these and yet uh, the minister maintained the five-week timeline uh, based on the explanation the she gave the week, House? The five-week the five week timeline is because they have, they have not been able to find out where the problem is. They found out. They've not found out where the problem is. And these are under sea tables on seabed. So the process of diagnosing the problem buying the spares that has to be fixed, extracting the damaged cables from the seabed, working on it, replacing them with the, the damage for new ones, and also being able to get all the permits to be able to move from Europe to Africa to fix these problems on the coast of Senegal and, and, and Abidjan is what will take the five weeks. So that's the explanation she gave the house. And that's also the same explanation which was the NTA's first release that was uh, put out in the public domain um, yesterday. Duke, you talk about the MPs uh, discussing what the minister has submitted so far. What are some of the dominant issues that they've raised on what the minister has said? For instance, the deputy ranking member on the, um, on the communications committee, Sam George, believes that if the NTA had been proactive and had put in place certain backup measures, this would not have occurred. She believes that the NC has slept on their job, and that's the reason why the entire country is suffering. Hainan is also, for instance, is also saying that there is a need for the telcos to be in the enabling environment to be able to do more uh, than, they, than, than they are currently able to do, and the NC should be able to put in place a foolproof measure. The minister did indicate that the NC has just developed um, 
a licensing regime for the satellite to earth network operators, and that it wasn't previously possible. So that's why she said that uh, right now it's only. It's, she said one cable is the one that has been you know, web one is the satellite uh, satellite internet service provider that has been licensed. Starlink is in the process of being licensed, which means that remember last year there was an issue about Starlink being introduced in the Ghanaian market, and the statement that was quickly released by NCA to say that they have not been licensed. Well, she did say on the floor of Parliament that they are in the process of being licensed, which means that it could be the license, the licensing regime could be completed anytime soon so that they can start full, operating fully in the country. But she did indicate that the satellite to earth um, internet service providers are very, very expensive. And she expects that it's rather businesses would use the, these alternatives rather than uh, personal, uh, by individual uses because they are very, very expensive and not within the pocket reach of many Ghanaians. Duke, before you go, you talk about uh, uh, the, the minority members questioning uh, the NCA and saying that or accusing the NCA of sleeping on the job. Are they calling for heads to roll? Yes, yes. They, they, they believe that this could have been handled better and the minister should not be here blaming a force majeure or an act of God for, uh, for this and that nobody prepared for it. But uh, she's indicating that stringent measures could have been implemented to ensure that not all the satellites, not all the networks are on similar cables to, to the extent to have that when they go out, everything is affected. Thank you very much, Duke Meso Poku. He's our correspondent in Parliament. Thank you for bringing us update on what the Minister of uh, for Communications and Digitalisation, Esla Owusu Okufol, has been uh, telling MPs as regard uh, the country's progress on the internet blackout. As you may have noticed, connectivity has improved greatly in the last uh, 12 hours. However, the problem has not been fully resolved. For instance, some customers of the electricity company of Ghana and the Northern uh, Electricity Distribution Company, NETCO, are still facing challenges uh, loading prepaid credit. I'm joined by Leila Abubakar. She's external communications manager for the Electricity Company of Ghana. Good evening to you, ma'am. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. This afternoon, we heard that, indeed, uh, management of the ECG uh, was meeting to find a way forward resolving this. Can you tell us some of the conclusions, uh, particularly solutions for customers? Yes, our chief information security officer has informed me that um, they've been on this since, I think, the incident happened on Thursday, uh, trying to resolve as many of the issues that were arising from the loss of connectivity. Obviously, no one expected this. And so it has also brought to ECG's attention that we need to strengthen our own systems and create redundancies that we can operate on in case certain things like this occur. So um, we have looked at a lot of eventualities and we found various mitigations for this that we are going to be putting before the board so that in case this happens again, we are able to trigger them. It will mean more cost for the company, but it's something worth investing in, considering how the impact can be. But so far, due to the improvement in the last 24 hours, a lot of our customers have been able to get hold of credits now and are on supply. The few that are left are being directed to our vendors and our district offices for assistance. And these meters are mainly the Alpha T and D Liberty system meters. But a lot of them are being resolved and just a few isolated cases remain. Just a few isolated cases, you say. Are you able to tell us the percentage, for instance, of your customers that are facing these challenges that you call just a few? No, I, we know that a lot of the issues came from the Alpha Liberty system. But since yesterday, a lot of them have been able to buy credit and have been able to load the tokens onto their meters. As for percentage, if I should mention any number now, I'll just be conjuring it and so I wouldn't even attempt. For those who have still challenges loading, like you're saying, you're going to solve uh, their challenge, are you able to give us any time frame? Because this afternoon, for instance, we, had, we heard customers who have not had light for the past five days. Yes. So the first point of call would be our contact center where we have people working in the background to be able to generate tokens for our customers. And so if customers call 
our customer center number, which is 0302-611611. They should be able to get some help within the shortest possible time. Otherwise, you identify the nearest vendor to you or a couple of vendors. Maybe the one you go to the first time might not be able to help you because their system might not be up as well. Some people are able to hotspot via using a VPN to some of these uh, vendors for them to be able to vend for them. But um, for now, a lot of the cases are being resolved. And so we just sort of tell our customers that if you are not able to load credit at the moment, please call our customer service number for onward uh, support. We'll have to end it here. Thank you very much, uh, Leila Abubakar. Uh, she's the External Communications Manager for the Electricity Company of Ghana. So you just heard that there. If you're not able to buy or load your electricity credit, uh, call customer service and uh, representatives will attend to you so you're able to get light. Uh, let's speak to Dr. Edward uh, Bamso Anson. He is senior lecturer at the Department of Computer Science and head of Cyber Security Lab at the Department University of Ghana, Ligon. Good evening to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good evening and thank you for having me. First, uh, in the academia, tell us how the internet problem has affected you uh, as a person and, of course, a lecturer. Yes. Um, in actual fact, we have been uh, affected so much because, uh, you know, because of our large class uh, lecture halls and all that. So part of our assignment and uh, lecturing has been put online. So students are expected to submit the assignments and to meet deadlines. Uh, students are expected to uh, download the tutorials that we organize with them online. And, uh, you know, and all other academic activities. There are also uh, other, um, you know, assignments that work, even require the internet for one to be able to, uh, you know, do some quick research and all that. And so all these things have had very negative impact on academic activities on campus. So, uh, Doc, I want to find out from you. You talk about some of the effects that you have had so far. The Minister of Communications and Digitalization, Eslo Usu just talked about, uh, well, she's in Parliament talking about the internet glitch and saying that perhaps it's a blessing in disguise and also saying some agreements are being signed, including with Starlight, to look at satellite internet. What's your view on what she's submitted so far? Yeah, um, thank you very much. You know, um, the use of satellite communication um, with the um, internet, uh, you know, the current situation that we find ourselves, are normally used as a backup plan for cases like, like this during emergency uh, situation. But if, if you uh, would actually check, you would realize that about 99% of the global internet connectivity is rather on the submarine cables and not through satellites. Uh, there are a number of reasons that has uh, contributed to that because, uh, you know, the first thing is that there is so much cost in, you know, um, establishing or uh, constructing the satellite communication for internet connectivity compared with the submarine. So if we decide to upload and turn everything rather onto the satellite, then it means the cost in maintaining and running such internet connectivity is rather going to go up. Indeed, the minister herself said it, that it's going to be very expensive and therefore may be for businesses and corporate organizations rather than individuals. So from where you sit, what do you think should be the interim solution for us as we wait for that five-week ultimatum for this to be dealt with? Yeah, actually, uh, what, what they, what they, beyond, beyond the cost, there are also other advantages of going on satellite. And one of the key disadvantages is the high, the, the low capacity transmission of the satellite communication compared with the submarine. Because the submarine could go as high up as in the traffic per second, but the satellite communication can only go up to 1,000 megabits per second, which is extremely low. And looking at our day, uh, day to day applications that we usually run on our, you know, Netflix, uh, and all of that, it wouldn't be able to support or provide that support that we actually did in our current day-to-day -day activities that we currently have. So beyond just the cost, in terms of the connectivity, the speed, 
that you and I need, even on our mobile phones and all of that, it will also slow down. So it's not just on that. And then see, even with the submarine cable, it is very, very reliable. What we must rather think of doing is to look at the number of cables that are used in the connectivity. Normally, these submarine cables, we don't use just single pathway for connectivity to be established all over the world. There are different, uh, you know, connectivity, like different channels through which such connection is actually established. So I would rather, would have suggested that, yes, satellite might be established to have that alternative way or means of, uh, you know, connecting whenever there is, let's say, um, 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 a natural disaster like an earthquake and all of that. But what the global, you know, um, um, and the developed countries rather do is to invest in having multiple channels through the submarine cables rather than investing in the satellite communication, even though that would also be for emergency cases whenever a situation of this sort uh, actually arises. Oh, ended here. Thank you very much. And that was Dr. Edward uh, Damso Anson. He is senior lecturer at the Department of Computer Science and head of cybersecurity lab at the Department University of Ghana, Legon. Thank you for speaking to us. Now, it's one of Accra's busiest and biggest event centers. And you remember the Fantasy Dome hosted the city's most controversial events in the midst of Ghana's COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns. It has been pulled down and the owner, Leslie Queno, is crying foul. First, let's bring you the background uh, to the story. Christian Yale joins me in the studio uh, to uh, give us a bit of background to uh, bringing us where we are. Christian, what do we know? All right, so we know that this 20,000 seater capacity at the face was established some five years ago. You know, the owner tells us that he built it or invested about $5 million into the project back then. And now it is estimated to be costing around $25 million. So you can imagine what goes into its establishment and everything around it. Now, the main issue around this has been the lease or the tenancy agreement, which expired December 31, 2023, which was last year. And so since then, you know, the trade fair or management of the trade fair center is embarking on a new project, a new center that they expect it to be able to host, you know, a number of uh, these events that the uh, Fantasy Dome is hosting these days. And so when they are able to complete that new project, which they call it the Ghana International Trade Fair Center Development Project, they would have a convention and exhibition center, a technology hub, a retail mall, commercial offices, and what have you. So it is part of the reasons they have been, you know, pushing for the management or the leadership of the Fantasy Dome to relocate after the tenancy agreement ended or expired last year. But according to the trade fair management, all efforts to get them to relocate have proven futile. We have been speaking to the management of the Fantasy Dome, uh, Leslie Queno, who you mentioned earlier, who tells us that, you know, after the tenancy agreement expired, they approached the leadership of the Trade Fair Center and requested for a 60-day extension. Now, that within that period, because they were receiving some form of threat from the Trade Fair Center over a possible demolition, he went ahead to an Accra High Court to secure an injunction to sort of um, extend that period so that they can have time to relocate. We'll be speaking to Mr. Queno very shortly, but you give us the background because we understand this is not the first demolition that has taken place in that area. We understand somewhere 2019, 2020, there was another demolition or exactly. perhaps even the first demolition that affected the office of a news uh, uh, person, uh, yes. uh, uh, Mr. Archer, for instance. Exactly. Can you bring us that background that led us to this place? Exactly. So that one is there. Um, there are issues also around some assurances that were given to the owners of the Fantasy Dome back door. And it is part of the reasons that the, uh, some believe that the delay came about in terms of the relocation because they were expecting to relocate by end of March 
in this month, which is something that they are working on. The, he, for instance, mentions the fact that they wanted to relocate to areas like Legon and around the University of Ghana area to have a place that can equally, you know, when it comes to construction and siting, you know, venues like these, uh, some of all of these strategies come to play. Areas or places where you'd get people to easily move around and get to the location. So, yeah, you have it right. This is not the first time that it's happening, just like the background you gave us. And so, some believe that that, for instance, there may be some background or an underlining issue that is going on that we may not have an understanding of. For instance, if you have ex uh, requested for a 60-day extension, why do you go to court to secure an injunction when you could, you know, amicably resolve issues like this? So probably these are some questions that we can put to him once we begin to talk to him to get some understanding. But the Trade Fair Center is saying that they were not served that rate that Mr. Leslie Quino talks about. Something he can answer. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Christian Yale there, bringing us updates and that background to the story. We'll be speaking to uh, Mr. Queno very shortly, but let me bring you a situational report of what we saw when we went to the place. And uh, Job Kwabena uh, uh, Laboja joins me in the studio. Uh, Job, you returned from the site uh, of, of where Fantasy Dome used to be. What did you see when you went there? Okay, so... Um I must say that uh, the place, um, as it stands now, looks like a security zone now, because we're not allowed entry to the, uh, the, the, the project site. Um, when we got there, we realized that uh, the security was tight. And the security officer there actually told us that uh, national security has taken over the place. And for that matter, he's been instructed not to uh, let anybody in. So um, we, I stood there, and then I peeped inside, and I realized that uh, construction was ongoing, uh, still at the foundation level. And you could see CCTV cameras uh, installed there. And uh, that, basically, that is what is actually there uh, at the moment. And the place has been demolished, except one building on the right-hand side that you could see is still standing. We don't know what is uh, inside there because we're not allowed uh, access. Laboja, I want you to stay here. We'll continue with this, uh, this very discussion as regards what you saw and reactions from the area there. But I'm joined by Leslie Queno. He's the owner of Fantasy Dome. Good evening to you, sir. Thank you for joining us on Hot Edition. Uh, thank you for having me. First of all, we heard the news yesterday, but we do understand that the demolition took place on Saturday. Can you tell us what you know? What happened? Um, yes, what, what I do know was on Saturday morning around 10 a.m., I had a, a call from my security, and before I picked up the phone, the phone went off. I called him back several times. He didn't respond. So I rushed to the site to see what was going on. When I got there, I realized that my facility had been surrounded by close to 30 or so men with machine guns uh, who had inserted themselves at national security. And I asked to speak to the leader. As I went in to speak to him, I noticed that there were four excavators um, on my location, completely crushing my air conditioners, the walls, all my production equipment, everything in its side was just crashing on its way to completely demolishing and, and destroying the facility. I went to him and I said, sir, I have an injunction. I filed for an injunction, and I have the papers in my hand. Um, you are not supposed to be doing this. And he said to me, well, sorry, sir, I'm from National Security. I'm here to protect the workers of the trade fair to do the demolition. Um, that's a, a matter between you and the trade fair. And I said to him, this is a court um, document showing that the demolition should not happen until we appear in court because we have to respond to it. Unfortunately, that went on head, so I called the police. And I called uh, the national police who showed up within 10, 15 minutes. Um, and they also questioned them and they stopped the activity once the national police showed up um, in, in their numbers. So what you're saying, Mr. Queno, is that the people who undertook that demolition identified themselves as coming from the national security? Um, yes, um, the, the demolition was obviously done by four um, 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 excavators and, and, and bulldozers. But the people that were surrounding, the, um, as you heard, it's a security zone. They had surrounded with machine guns. They were from national security, correct? Earlier in your interview, you indicated that you actually accused directly the CEO of the trade fair company of being behind that. I, I, is, is that what you really said? And is that what you mean? Um, absolutely. The National Security Authority told me that they were instructed um, to protect them um, through the uh, CEO of the National Trade Fair Company, which is Agnes Edu. Absolutely. Have you spoken to him and has he confirmed that he ordered, as it were, the national security operatives to come to your site to demolish your property? 
Uh, no, I've had no communications. Uh, Miss Agnes Edu is a lady. I have not communicated with her. We actually haven't had any communication since uh, December when I wrote her a letter requesting a 60-day extension of my lease so I can, I can take my, um, my facility and relocate it. You having called uh, the trade fair uh, uh, company representative you talk about, and the person hasn't called you either to give any explanations? Uh, uh, absolutely. At this point, I mean, the damage is done, right? I mean, they've destroyed the Ghana entertainment industry, they've destroyed my facility, they've destroyed my investment, and more importantly, they've acted unlawfully in the, in the law of Ghana. I mean, you do not proceed with a demolition fully knowing that there's a writ and injunction that has been filed, and you've been served. And we have proof of service. We've done everything. We've gone as far as done substituted service. We've met all the obligations of the court. So for you to go ahead and do that, fully knowing that, is illegal. And it's in contempt of, of the order or the risk uh, or, or the injunction. We'll go to the legal bit of it, but let me get an understanding of the investment, as it were. We had information that you spent about $5 million on it, and there was an estimation from you that it may be worth $25 million now. Is that what it is? So, so just to clarify, I, I am not saying that my $5 million investment has, has also ballooned into $25 million investment. I think that I, as, as a businessman and as any businessman, if you invest $5 million in any business, um, whether it's in Ghana, the U.S., Malaysia, or Hong Kong, you have to accrue and, and, and recognize your returns on it. And in five years, if I'd invested this in the U.S. or anywhere else, I could have quadrupled or quintupled my investment. And that's what I was mentioning in that, in that, in that clip. I wasn't saying that I, I invested five million dollars, which I did, and now it's worth twenty-five million. I was saying that, you know, right now my investment has gone down the drain. If I'd taken this investment in any country that respects the rule of law and does the right thing, I would have accrued or uh, multiplied my investment possibly by five. And that is what, what that's what's a matter of hand. And I think the real question that I should be asked is, why would any company in this country demolish anybody's property without a court order. You know, the trade fair should be requested to produce a court order because it's an illegal act. I don't think you can demolish anyone's kiosk on your land, whether they are there illegally or not, without a court order. If you believe strongly that you have to do something, you go to court. If everybody did everything they wanted, everybody would a bulldozer and just keep knocking people's stuff down. That's why we have courts. You, and that's why we have law and order in this country. You, you, you seem to have answered a bit of that question yourself by saying that in a country of law and order, you think that what has happened is indicative of the fact that Ghana does not respect law and there's no order in this country. I, 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 would, not, I would not characterize it to that. I'm just speaking to, to, the, to the trade fair. They have acted without a court order. And if they have a court order, I would like them to produce it. We all do know that in Ghana, before you can demolish anyone's property you have to have a court order regardless of whether they are a tenant that whatever they do on your land you have to get a court order i just request the trade fair to produce a court order even after my injunction which i have which they've been served with, for them to act so unlawfully they have to have a court order Let me ask and i think ghana should request that from them where is your court order let me ask you 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 are saying that you're claiming that you secured a court injunction so obviously this demolition uh, per your explanation and your own word this should be in breach of uh, a court order or the injunction what's your next line of action uh, obviously um we have to go back um, to court the next court date with the substituted service was April 18th. That's what the judge was going to hear both parties and obviously um, make a judgment or direct us to the next steps. Obviously, that did not happen. So the next steps is to follow the, the law, right? And and file contempt, which is clearly uh, there's contempt of that 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 writ and, and that injunction. And obviously, you know, we, we have to put the pieces together because this is a huge blow to the Ghana entertainment industry. I mean, we keep saying we want you know, um, 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 non-governmental investment, you know, the government should always be an answer to all our problems. And this is a huge area in which we need a lot of help. We don't have entertainment venues. We don't have entertainment equipment. We don't have production equipment. And, and this is a place that had all of it. Why would we destroy it? You know, what, what, to what sense does it benefit Ghana to destroy the largest indoor facility, possibly in Africa, in Ghana, that has full production equipment that is used for TV shows, that is used for... Um, um, award shows, that's used for concerts, that's used for church services, that's used for sporting events. What, 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 what gain do we get by destroying it? Mm, what do you when do you intend to file this uh, or take this court action you talk about? 
I'm, I'm obviously meeting with my lawyers right now, and we'll file it as soon as, as possible. I mean, because obviously we have to also do a detailed assessment of the destruction. I mean, clearly everything has been destroyed, and based on even your eyewitness <laughs> um, story, a lot has been destroyed. And, and that leads me to the next question. If, if the Trade Federalist Act, why do they need national security to secure the location? If they'd actually evicted me, and they want me to come and pick up my 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 property. Why is national security secure in the place? Mr. Um, Mi- why, why would they not allow the media to come and see what has happened? Mi- Mr. Kwenu, you just talked about aside from the worth of 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 the property, you talked about equipment in there. Are you able to give us an estimated uh, cost or price of what you've lost, even in terms of the equipment that uh, are there that have been destroyed as a result of the demolition? I I I had. Um, a large um, equipment storage area in which housed um, a lot of um, um, LED screens. I had a lot of lighting. I had a lot of sound equipment. I had a lot of staging. I had a lot of trussing. Um, I had almost every single production equipment that you can think about. I mean, I, I will not disclose the value because we are still trying to figure what has been damaged, what hasn't. And at this point, all I can tell you is that um, um, it, it's a significant amount of investment that was made to make the trade fair a truly uh, tanky solution. I even had chairs and tables, um, I mean, and, and barricades, you know, and, and all of this was destroyed. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's fair on any level. I mean, why would you destroy chairs, you know, in, in a storage room? Mm, Does that make sense? It's not fair. Before you go, very briefly, uh, one of the questions that has come up is whether or not really there have been some underlining issues that we don't know. Are you able to tell us whether indeed there have been some underlining issues beyond the, these legal uh, uh, communications that we've had? Um, um, please ask the question again. Uh, you dropped off a little Were there bit. any underlining issues beyond the court issues that and conversations that you've had? Not, not that I'm, I'm aware of. I do know that the trade fair wanted access to the property earlier than I would have been able to vacate it. But my facility is a very large facility. You know, it sits on almost two acres. I had over 80 bathrooms or close to a little over 70 bathrooms. I had dressing rooms. I had, um, I had conference rooms and storage areas. It's not something that you just pick up. It is not a tent that you just fold up and move. It takes some time and coordination to get it done, especially to disassembling and assembling it. So, I mean, maybe on, on, on their behalf, they would have probably wanted me to move faster. But unfortunately, it's not possible. You have to find a place to go to. You have to find a place to set up. And, and that's why we went to court so that the court can give us the appropriate time to relocate. We'll have to end it here. Thank you very much, uh, Leslie Queno. He is the owner of Fantasy Dome. Thank you for spending some time explaining your issue to us. I'm joined by uh, uh, by uh, Abraham Amaliba. He is a legal practitioner. Good evening to you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm sure you heard the explanations uh, being given by the owner of Fantasy Dome as a lawyer. What legal, of course, he's going to court to file for breach of uh, a court injunction. But beyond that, what are the other legal and indeed financial ramifications of what has just taken place? I think that if uh, he's saying that they file an application, and don't forget that that's not an order yet. If they file an application for injunction, and this was uh, served. I uh, hear him say subject service, which means that it is whether they have been served or not, the national security has notice of it. Then I am of the view that he can proceed to court for contempt proceedings. Now, this is a prohibitive injunction, which says that don't do something. And that is, they don't pull down the the, the edifice. And so if the national security has gone ahead to do that, it means that the national security is in contempt. Don't also forget that um, the national security may say that they were not saved and they had no knowledge of the contempt application. But because it is subject service, subject service simple means that you post the notice in the dailies, you post a notice at the premises. All this amounts to notice to the national security. And so they can't wiggle their way out. When an injunction is served you or any person, you stay your hands off 
particularly if it is something to do with uh, a prohibitive injunction, not to do something. But once they have gone ahead to do it, I think that uh, contempt application will lie against the head of the national security. What are the ramifications for the national security? Well, they have to go and explain to the court why they did what they did, but uh, I'm finding it difficult to see how they can t uh, wiggle their way out. On the part of the owner of the uh, properties that have been destroyed, he could also, after the contempt application, uh, issue a writ for compensation, a civil action for compensation if anything has been destroyed and he thinks that they need to pay. So two actions. One is a contempt. The second one is uh, a writ against the national security for the damages caused. Listening to the owner of Fantasy Dome, he, he seemed to express uh, the view that w we don't respect rule of law and order in this country. You've listened to the explanation yourself as a lawyer. What are your thoughts on his feelings? That is the point that is mind-boggling to me when you have a state agency and not any state agency but the national security, you know, involved in this matter when clearly as a national security institution that institution should be the first institution that would obey laws go by the rules he's right in saying that you cannot pull down a person's property without a court order he's right even if that person is on your land and you know and you have all the documents you still have to go to court for the court to give an order what the national security has done is nothing more than lawlessness. The national security is supposed to prevent lawlessness, but the national security in this case is engaged in lawlessness. And it's mind-boggling that state institutions should be doing that. And I know the national security has a legal department. And why would the national security be doing all these things? I think this issue brings up the conversation of the unorthodox means by which the national security sometimes operates. Moving forward, how do we deal with this? Because it's kind of surfacing in a different way. The national security operates in an opaque manner. And because of this opacity, they, 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 they tend to take the law into their hands. They feel they are above the law. And so I think that in a democratic society such, such as ours, these institutions must be seen engage in democratic conduct and not to arrogate themselves the right to do what they want without recourse to the law. Another institution is the BNI, now they call the National Investigation Bureau. These two institutions see themselves above the national laws, and I think that is a problem, and we must, we must check that. We'll have to end it here. Thank you very much, Abraham Amalaba. He is a lawyer. Thank you for uh, sharing your views with us as well. You're still here on Hot Edition. My name is Beatrice Edu. Let's wrap up this conversation with Laboja. Laboja, you were giving us an idea of what the place looks like uh, when you visited uh, the, the, the site of the demolition. But briefly, in like 30 seconds, did you get any reactions at all from people who live around? I know around that place is also a university. Did you get any reactions? Okay, so um, we actually placed a few calls to those uh, some contact we secured from the the, the website of the uh, how do you call it trade fair the trade fair web, website, and the people we spoke to actually in case, uh, they, they are saying that because of the projects over there they, they they have vacated the place and they don't know what when they are coming back, so basically that is what we can tell you. But I must say that we are working on a comprehensive report or a story on this particular project on our manifesto checks on Ghana tonight. And we'll be bringing details and visuals of the project site tonight at 10 p.m. with Afrit. Thank you very much, uh, Job Kwabena Laboja. And also to you, Christian Yale, for bringing us the background to this story. You're still here on Hot Edition. My name is Beatrice Seru. Stay with us. And coming up is a business and Michael is here to bring us the latest in business. Stay with us.
Get ready for an epic adventure. Join TV3 on a two-day expedition of the Western Wonders of Ghana as part of the Ghana Month celebration happening from Friday 29th to Saturday 30th of March. This is Journey to the West. Explore the rich history of Cape Coast Castle. Walk through the lush forest of Kaku. Witness the breathtaking Insulazo Stilt Village for a journey through time. Immerse yourself in the magic of bonfires, groove to sensational music performances and experience the beats with DJs on rotation. Indulge in mouth-watering dishes and refreshing drinks while creating unforgettable memories. Don't miss the chance to celebrate Ghana's beauty and culture. Join us for two days filled with adventure, culture, and a whole lot of fun. Journey to the West. To book a seat for this Odyssey, call 0264 932732. It's Journey to the West. Hashtag Ghana Month Celebration. Hashtag Journey to the West. Hashtag Explore Ghana. To you by Malta Guinness. Hello there, good evening and welcome to the business segment here on Hot Edition. I am Michael Obudu. Straight into our stories now, the Minister for Communications and Digitalization, Eslo Usuekufu, has underscored the need to invest in and diversify Ghana's internet infrastructure to mitigate any disruptions in service delivery in the country. This follows major internet cuts across the sub-region due to sub-sea cable cuts which have heavily interrupted the operations of businesses in the country reliant on internet connectivity. The minister spoke to the media on the sidelines of an AI conference organized in collaboration with the Ministry of Finance and the IMF. It's there to, uh, 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 on a small scale, but we need to scale it up. But we also need to look at the cost implications of all of that. In these are challenging economic times. The network operators and ISPs are investing in the infrastructure. Government is supporting that investment. We're working on building shared infrastructure that anybody at all can use without putting in place that extensive capital investment upfront that is needed. So there's a lot that is already happening. But what this has taught us is that digital infrastructure, connectivity, applications and services are indispensable to our current way of life and our future way of life. And so if we didn't give it 100% focus as at now, we should. And we need to look at resilient infrastructure. We need to look at climate-friendly infrastructure. We need to look at more scalable systems being put in place. And we need to look at working even closer together with the private sector. She also clarified that internet will be restored in the country progressively over the next five weeks as efforts are being made to restore the broken subsea cables. I'm sure we all can testify to the fact that it is better today to connect on the various um, internet-enabled platforms than it was on Thursday. So a lot has been done in these few days to look at uh, ways to go around this problem. NCA is saying that it will take five weeks in the minimum for the cable that has been disrupted to be repaired and for full internet connectivity to be restored. It's not saying that it will take five weeks for us to get connectivity at all. Connectivity is there, we're all using it, um, but it will, it's still impacted, it's still slow, it still goes off at times. So it will take five weeks for us to enjoy the full experience that we had before this issue came up. But even as we speak, the network operators, the regulator, they are working around the clock to look at alternatives to make, to bring even more connectivity to us on this continent. And they are succeeding. 
So that was Minister of Communication and Digitalization, Esla Owusu Ekufu, speaking there. Away from that, the Chartered Institute of Marketing, Ghana, is making a case for businesses and institutions to help create and respect consumer rights across all sectors. The Institute stresses that consumers must demand that the technology environment is well regulated in a manner that prioritizes fairness, transparency and accountability. Consumers deserve to know their rights in order not to be taken advantage of or misled. These rights also guarantee that buyers get absolute value for money. Last year, we thought it wise to institute that this day, the 15th of March in Ghana, as the World Consumer Rights Day, a day set aside for us to make that clarion call to make, uh, embark on an advocacy program to create awareness for consumers to know their rights and continue to uphold them, for organizations, providers of goods and services to also know the responsibilities they have to, to ensure that consumer rights are, are respected. Well, on that note, that'll be all for the business segment here on Hot Edition. For more business stories, please check out our website. It's 3news.com forward slash business. I am Michael Obudu. Thank you for listening. As always, please stay safe. Yes, so here on Hot Edition, my name is Beatrice Edu. Billy Sean joins us with the latest in sports. Bill, what do you have? Well, in athletics, uh, six Ghanaian athletes have qualified to the semifinals of the 100 meters. In the men's division, Benjamin Azamati, Banabas Age, and Safo Ansa made the cut. Whilst in the women's division, uh, Haluti Hall, Mary Boachi, and Benedicta Kwatima also made it. Now, legendary long jumper Ignatius Geza of course, believes that Ghana will win medals. But Ghana are struggling in the 400-meter heats. Uh, Grace Eduntria, Sandra Pia, Bridget Annan, and Martin Ousu and Chief failed to make it to the top three in their respective races. Now, South Africa's hockey teams have withdrawn from the hockey competition at the 2023 African Games, citing concerns over poor pitch at the Tudosia Oku Stadium in Accra. The team expressed dissatisfaction with the preparation efforts in place and voiced fears that the substandard pitch could lead to long-term injuries for their players. In light of these concerns, both the male and female teams have pulled out of the competition to safeguard the well-being of the Olympic-bound players. But events before the start uh, of the hockey event, uh, the Minister of Youth and Sports was saying that I mean, the, there was a problem with the Federation. They had to go through a back and forth and come to an understanding of how the pitch should look like and uh, the nature of the pitch, you know, ahead of the games. And so uh, this was an explanation he gave just before the hockey uh, started. Before I do go, there's uh, boxing where four boxers will fight for a chance to earn places in the medal zone. Abdul Wahid Omar, Joseph Komi, Harry Mom, and Daniel Plunge will compete in their respective categories. Of course, that brings an end to the sports segment here on the 3FM Hot Edition. My name is Billy Shen. And of course, uh, Christian is standing by. He has uh, a big issue that, you know, has been happening. Christian, please feed us. Indeed. And Christian, uh, Christian is going to give us details of uh, what the opposition in D.C. is saying, asking for the head of the sports minister because of South Africa's decision to withdraw from the race or from the game, should I say, of a poor organization uh, of, of the entire game. Uh, what is contained in that statement? So, you know, the NDC is saying that it is appalled by the embarrassing spectacles that have characterized the ongoing uh, All-African Games. Now, it has cited the instances where a number of the Guinean athletes have withdrawn from the ongoing Games due to lack of adequate preparation and lack of, you know, suitable equipment uh, to aid them to actively engage or participate in the ongoing Games. It has also raised concerns about the 100 195 million dollars that you know was pushed or pumped into the preparation for 
the games while they also mentioned the 48 million dollars that has been made available to the local organizing committee and so these are the demands by the ndc they are calling for the resignation and or dismissal of the minister of youth and sport for his gross incompetence that is according to them his gross incompetence which has occasioned the monumental embarrassment to the nation also they are calling for the dissolution of the local organizing committee for the ongoing All-African Games. And they also demand a forensic audit into the budget and expenditure for the preparation and organization of the Games. And also, I mean, finally, they want a televised probe by Parliament into the expenditure and organization of the Games. And as you know, they, they are launching a scathing attack on the NPP administration, calling it ineptitude, you know, incompetent, for once again bringing such a disrepute to the nation after rendering the national economy bankrupt. Thank you very much, Christian Yale, for bringing us our details of that statement from the NDC as well as Bill Ishan, the latest in sport. That's how we end a hot edition today on 3FM. Our top stories, government rolls out program to license additional satellite internet service providers to deal with disruption to internet connectivity in the country. We brought you details from the minister's briefing of parliament. Also, owner of Fantasy Dome says he will fight, uh, he will file a suit against a trade fair company for demolishing his property. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Beatrice Edu. Log on to 3news.com for more news. Good evening and enjoy the rest of our programs. Thank <music> you.